Okay, welcome once again. Uh, we're here now for the seventh time to celebrate the American victories at the battles of Saratoga in Yorktown, which um, are inextricably, inextricably linked because the American victory at Saratoga helped to convince the French to enter into an alliance with the newly independent United States um, and resulted in French participation in what became a world war um, which occupied many of the British forces and then resulted in the French participation on this continent in the ultimate victory at Yorktown. Um, it's hard to imagine how important each of these victories were. I mean, the Saratoga victory had been preceded by two crushing defeats that the American Army had suffered on Long Island and Brandywine, uh, the latest in September of, of 1777. Saratoga was only a month after that um, it resulted in the surrender of an entire army um, led by Burgoyne. And similarly, the Battle of Yorktown had been preceded by two crushing defeats at Charlestown and Camden. Um, there were some smaller victories in between, um, but these were just amazing results uh, that led to the ultimate triumph of the American and French forces in American independence. Um, we're here today to honor that memory and to quote General Terry Leone, who participated in some of these earlier ceremonies, to learn something about our own history, um, both French and otherwise. I received the education that most Americans had about the American Revolution. And it was only little by little that I discovered the enormous role that the French had in the American Revolution. When I visited Yorktown, I looked at the maps and said, there are a lot of French soldiers there. I mean, probably 40% of all of the soldiers, all of the Navy, most of the guns, munitions, money, and whatnot, were French. And then one night at Francis Tavern, we had a lecture by Laura Riccio, who wrote the book, uh, The Marquis, about the Marquis de Lafayette, whom we know primarily for his services to America. And she'd visited Versailles and discovered that a bust of Houdon, of which we have a copy, a, a Houdon bust of Lafayette, and we have a copy in, at Francis Tavern, was in a closet there and she said well why is this not on display and she said well why shouldn't it be on display he was a great hero in America and she was asked but what of all the other French who participated in the war and indeed 3,000 French soldiers died on American soil and many more died in other parts um, of the world so we're very privileged here to have a number of groups representing both American and French um, organizations. I mean, first of all, they're listed later, but I'll mention the Veteran Corps of Artillery, one of the, the longest active military organizations um, in this country, which appear at many of our ceremonies. We have the Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York, which own and maintain Francis Tavern are here. We have the first continental chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution um, are also here. And I'll have to go through the, um, the long list here. The Lower Manhattan Historical Association, which of course organized this and sponsors it, is here. The Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society, um, which participates in a number of events in common with uh, both the Lower Manhattan Organization and, and uh, the Sons of the Revolution is here. The National Democratic Club, the, New the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, 
And on the French side, we have the Ministry of Europe and, and Foreign Affairs. I think um, one of my favorite consuls, Enclair Legendre, um, is here in spirit, not presently, and is represented by Brigadier General Roland Marguerite of the um, military liaison to the French mission of the United Nations. We also, as of last year and this year again, have the Society of American Military Engineers. And we also have a representative from the United States Military Academy, a professor a lecture on, on engineering at that place, which is appropriate since two of the people with that we are honoring here, um, Pierre L'Enfant and Stephen uh, Rochefontaine, were professors at West Point back in the early uh, 1800s. The Lycée Francais is here in force today, and like, like to uh, happy to see you. And the uh, Fédération des Anciens Combattants Français has several representatives here, and it's always great to see these these gentlemen. And last but not least, let me introduce uh, a re representative of our host, uh, the um, of Trinity Parish here at. Uh, St. Paul's Chapel, the little chapel that stood, which was here during the American Revolution and has been here uh, ever since. And, and of course, Trinity Parish is, uh, is a group which looks back, which looks at the community, and which looks forward. Um, I'm happy to present John McCann. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. And welcome, bienvenue, on this beautiful Saturday. On behalf of our rector, Bill Lupfer, and vicar, Phil Jackson, welcome to Trinity Church and our outpost, St. Paul's Chapel, uh, to celebrate the victories of the battles of Saratoga and Yorktown, both, as Ambrose spoke extensively, marked decisive turning points in the Revolutionary War. My name is John McCann. I'm a parishioner, a member here. I'm also a historian. Um, I'm a architectural historian and writing a detailed architectural history of this church. And um, my first uh, understanding of the, of the American Revolution was when I was in school in Paris and I learned about the French involvement when I was about 10 years old. So I was ahead of the game, a lot of folks. Um, I think that uh, Ambrose did a great job of welcoming all the groups, so I just want to underscore that welcome. And uh, we're here today to honor Stéphane Roche, Rochefontaine, who is buried here at St. Paul's Chapel, and Pierre L'Enfant, uh, also General Horatio Gates, Alexander Hamilton, and Marinus Willett, all laid to rest in our historic churchyard at Trinity Church, four blocks up. Just a few words about our parish's history. In 1697, George III, or I'm sorry, King William III, granted us a um, charter. And his successor, Queen Anne, uh, increased the parish's land holdings to nearly 300 acres on November 4th, 1705. From the beginning until today, the parish of Trinity Church has been an integral part of its growth and history of New York and our nation. The current church on the site, which is again up four blocks, built by Richard Upjohn in the Gothic Revival style, is the third Trinity Church and consecrated in 1846. The church is currently undergoing a two-year extensive cleaning, restoration, and upgrading of infrastructure led by the architectural firm of Murphy, Burnham, and Buttrick, who renovated St. Patrick's Cathedral. We all look forward to returning to Trinity Church for worship and our other activities. In May of next year, we will also be opening the doors of Trinity Commons, which is a building across on, on Trinity, Trinity Place, uh, right across from the church, our spiritual living room in Lower Manhattan, and a community center where we will welcome the community with diverse programming. The first church, a much smaller and simpler building, was destroyed during the revolution, during the great fire of 1776. And as probably you all know, during the, the duration of the revolution, this city became the British military and political base of operations in North America, following the departure of George General Washington and the Continental Army 
shortly after the Battle of Long Island. Thankfully to, to the Battle of Yorktown and Saratoga, with the help of our French friends, uh, George Washington was able to return and was actually, New York for a brief spell for two years was the capital of the United States. And he was inaugurated in 1789 at Federal Hall, which is at Wall Street. Um, uh, and he attended a Thanksgiving service down here, which was, this was considered countryside in those days, even though it's only four blocks away. St. Paul's Chapel was built in 1766. It's the oldest colonial building in existence in New York, and it was modeled after St. Martin in the Fields, um, classic Georgian revival style in London. And it celebrated its 250th anniversary in October of 17, 2017. Four of the original members of the Society of Cincinnati Officers who served under Washington bar are buried here. Marshal John Lewis, Major John Lewis, Major Job Sumner, Lieutenant Colonel Etienne Marie de Rochefontaine, and Dr. John Francis Vache. And now please welcome the wonderful group of students, à l'étudiant de Lycée Français de New York, and they're going to sing the Star Spangled Banner and La Marseillaise. Thank you. And that was to inspire us into battle um, in both cases. Um, we're now going to move, talk about the three American revolutionary heroes. Um, 
And what they have in common was that they fought on the American side and they're buried in Trinity Churchyard at, uh, at Trinity Church. Um, Horatio Gates was the commander of the American forces um, at, at Saratoga, became known as the hero of Saratoga. Um, had a number of other adventures throughout the war, but that was his crowning moment, um, which we remember today. Also, Marinus Willett, who wasn't at Saratoga, but who was near to Saratoga at Fort Stanwix, and his um, thrust against the relief force of General St. Leger helped to persuade St. Leger not to relieve Burgoyne, um, so he is in his way a hero. And then we have Alexander Hamilton, um, you know, who we know a lot about, but who participated in the Battle of Yorktown, particularly the assault of Redoubt, um, Redoubt 10, which led to the end of the battle there. We will hear all about these people, and let me begin with Wesley O. IV, the president of the First Continental Chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution, Wes. Thank you, Ambrose. Welcome, everyone. Horatio Gates, born in 1727 in the county of Kent, England, began a career in the British Army when he was 18. He served in Germany in the War of the Austrian Succession and then in the British North American colonies during the French and Indian War, where he rose to the rank of major. When the war ended, the British Army was demobilized, and Gates' prospects for commissions and further promotions looked dim. Historians have written that he did not have enough wealth to purchase commissions for higher ranks, nor did he have sufficient social standing in the British class hierarchy. So he sold his major's commission and came to the American colonies when he was 45. He reestablished contact with George Washington, with whom he had served in the French and Indian Wars. And in 1773, he bought a modest plantation in Western Virginia, which he called Traveler's Rest, which is now near Carneysville in present day West Virginia. When fighting broke out in Lexington and Concord in 1775, Gates went to Mount Vernon and offered his services to General Washington. Congress then commissioned Gates as a brig brigadier general and as the first adjutant general in the Continental Army, taking advantage of Gates' considerable experience and skill in Army administrative affairs. But Gates apparently longed for a field command. So in 1776, he was given command of the Canadian Department reporting to Major General Philip Schuyler. When Congress blamed Schuyler for the loss of Fort Ticonderoga, Gates was given command of the entire Northern Department in August 1777. What great timing that was. Within a few weeks, the American Army in the North won a series of critical battles in and around Saratoga that resulted in the defeat and surrender of British General Burgoyne's entire army. Who gets credit for the American victory remains a subject of debate amongst historians. But General Gates and his supporters claim full credit for the stunning success, and Gates was presented the Congressional Gold Medal. Many historians consider the American victory of Saratoga to be the turning point of the entire Revolutionary War for the Americans. And of course, it was right after that that the French decided to support the American cause against the British. For General Gates, the years after Saratoga are probably best left forgotten, as he was suspected of being involved in a few plots against General Washington, including the infamous Conway Cabal in 1778 which resulted in General Gates apologizing to Washington for his role in the affair. He was then given command of the Southern Department, and General Gates proceeded to lead the American forces into a disastrous defeat against the British General Cornwallis 
at the Battle of Camden in South Carolina in 1780. The defeat ruined Mil uh, Gates' military reputation. And in 1784, after the end of the war, Gates retired and returned home to Traveler's, re Traveler's Rest. General Gates' first wife had died in 1783. So in 1786, he married again to a wealthy British woman originally from Liverpool, and they decided to start a new life. In 1790, they sold Traveler's Rest, freed their slaves, and moved north to Manhattan, where they bought a 92-acre estate, which, they called, which was called Rose Hill, which at the time was three miles north of the city in the area now bounded by East 23rd Street and East 30 to 32nd Street and between Madison Avenue and 3rd Avenue. Some New York City guides and real estate manuals still use the name Rose Hill to refer to that area. Gates and his wife became active in New York society and Gates even served a term in the New York State Legislature. Gates died at Rose Hill in 1806 at the age of 79 and is buried and was buried in the Trinity Church graveyard, although the location of the grave was lost over the years. That was, of course, rectified in 2012 when the Daughters of the American Revolution rededicated a gravestone in the cemetery in honor of General Gates, victorious American general at Saratoga. So with that, I hope you will join me in raising your glasses to General Gates. Hi. Hi, the next uh, hero that we will uh, commemorate here is Alexander Hamilton. I want to call on Nicole Chalet of the uh, Amer Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. Nicole. Thank you, it is an honor to be here today to help honor Alexander Hamilton, as well as the many other people that are being honored today. Alexander Hamilton, as a young teenager living in the Caribbean, saw that the only way that he could improve his station in life was through military glory. And he had his opportunity when he immigrated here to New York City, and he was a college student here when the Revolutionary War broke out. He first saw action as a militiaman just a few blocks away at the Battery, where he helped rescue cannons, steal cannon from the British under heavy uh, fire from the warship Asia. Hamilton served very actively in the revolution until he became the aide-de-camp to George Washington. And for four years, he was at the heart and center of the Revolutionary War operations within Washington's staff. But Hamilton knew that he still wanted to achieve that military glory, that he was searching for that moment. And he finally had that opportunity to lead a battalion at the Battle of Yorktown. And his charge and the bravery of the men under him of readout number 10 allowed the American, Continental, and French combined forces to finally achieve victory at that battle. And so we recognize not only Hamilton's contributions to the war, but what the war eventually did for him and propelled him to a national stage where he was then able to serve as the nation's first Secretary of Treasury and the many contributions he made to the nation's constitution and other founding institutions. So we once again thank you for being here today to honor not only Alexander Hamilton, but the many important men and women that helped make these battles and the Revolutionary War a success for the United States. Thank you. I next want to call on Jim Kaplan, the president of the Lower Manhattan Historical Association, to talk about one of his favorite patriots, Marinus Willett. Marinus Willett is probably uh, the least well known of the three patriots who we honor who are buried in uh, Trinity Churchyard, but in, I, in, my, in my opinion, he's no less important than the others. 
Uh, he had a very long career. He was a uh, military leader, an important military leader, an important New York City politician, and uh, a, a very important diplomat over a 50-year period. He first came to prominence in 1775 when the British were uh, sending troops north to fight in the Battle of Bunker Hill, and he stood as a member of the Sons of the uh, uh, Sons of Liberty, he stood in front of the British convoy on Broad Street, at 60 Broad Street, and said, you tr cannot send these troops there. You can only send light arms, not heavy arms. He was unarmed in front of an entire British army, and they said, who are you? What are you doing? Well, but in any way, a, a crowd gathered from the Sons of Liberty, and the British had to back off. So that was a great uh, patriot victory, and he became an important patriot hero. He became a member of the uh, uh, New York State uh, uh, militia in the uh, Revolutionary War. Supposedly, the British were going to burn the city of Peekskill, which was their policy of burning patriot towns. And he convinced his boss uh, to attack. And the British attack was foiled, so the city of Peekskill was never burned. You won't see anybody but to will it at Peekskill. But then he was sent up to Fort Stanwix. Fort Stanwix is in Rome, New York, for those of you who don't near near the turning point. And it was there that the British were going to try to encircle General Gates from the west with 3,000 troops under St. Leger. As, uh, and had they succeeded, there's little doubt that the British would, uh, would not have, would have been successful at Saratoga. But Gates stood with Peter uh, Gansafort at Fort Stanwix. The British surrounded them and said, uh, uh, you will have to give up the fort or else our, our Indian allies are going to massacre all your women and children. And uh, Willett, in a famous speech, said, I, I don't believe that a British officer would make such a danger, such a horrible uh, uh, address. You will have to kill us all before you, you, we're going to give up this fort. And ultimately, Fort Stanwix held. And as a result, they, if you go up to Fort Stanwix, which I encourage you to do, they'll say it's the fort that never surrendered. Now, after the American Revolutionary War, he was active with the Indians at the, uh, uh, in the West, but he came back here to New York City, and he was the high sheriff of, uh, uh, he was elected the high sheriff of New York right after the Revolution, where he was uh, responsible for handing out Tory land to Patriot uh, 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 fighters. Uh, and this was a very important part of what would later become uh, the Democratic Party. Now, he became a bitter opponent of the Federalist Party and the U.S. Constitution because it said that no state shall impair the obligation of contract, which meant that the lands that were given to the Patriots would have to be given back to their British owners. Uh, as you probably know, the uh, uh, Constitution passed. But he later was a leader in the uh, Tammany Society, the Anti-Federalist Society. In 1790, probably his greatest, event, greatest uh, achievement was uh, George Washington, even though he was from a different political party, so to speak, reached across the law and asked him if he could help settle the situation in the South, in, in uh, Alabama and Georgia. The United States, under the Treaty of Paris, controlled all land east of the Mississippi, but two th a very significant part of the southern was all controlled by the Creek Nation, and they were not friends of the United States. In fact, they'd been allies of the British, and they said that any white man who walked into the territory of, of uh, Alabama or Georgia would be scalped, so that wasn't a good situation. So uh, the state of Georgia insisted that Washington send the troops down to clear them out, but the United States didn't have that capability at the time. It was headquartered here in New York. So he sent Willett down, and Willett snuck into this, the state of Georgia, went to the Indian camp headed by Alexander McGivory, who was the Creek leader, and he said to him, look, Mr. McGivory, I represent George Washington. We're a peaceful people. We shouldn't be at war with one another. We should have a peace. I don't know what McGivory thought, but it was, it was, uh, uh, but in any event, uh, McGivory, uh, they, 23 Creek chiefs 
He said, come up to New York to meet the great white chief. 23 Creek chiefs came up to New York, and the Tammany Society rhymed and dined them, and they said, we're all brothers under the skin. And pretty soon, they wrote a treaty, the Treaty of New York, which was a fair treaty for the, between the Creeks and the Americans. And thus, the United States people were uh, permitted to come into Creek territory, but Creek, uh, the Creek lands were respected. And this was uh, a huge diplomatic success for the early United States. And Willett, Willett was responsible. So Tammany, uh, uh, the Tammany Society, uh, it, it is said that at, at the final uh, uh, toast, uh, McGivory said, you should be loyal to the principles of Chief Tammany, who believed that no men of w w different races could work together, and had cut the peace treaty with William Penn in Philadelphia. And if you were loyal to them, your city will be one of the greatest and most important in the world. Well, the Tammany Society, as you may know, the, the, the treaty with the Creeks was quickly broken, and of course, under Andrew Jackson, they were forced out to the West. But the Tammany Society would grow in importance here in the city. And in the elections of 1800, they would come to power and rule the city for the next 150 years. And it was really the principles of the Chief Tammany that the men of different races could work together, would be here. So that, in a sense, was Willett's legacy. Uh, Willett also was very active later in the War of 1812 when he was 73. He walked up to the, uh, to the uh, uh, steps of City Hall and he urged that New Yorkers should, fight, should come out and fight against the British. This was a very bitterly divided war. And he gave a stirring speech at which 20, after which 20,000 people joined the militia and the British never attacked. So now, he died in 1831 in Trinity Churchyard. There were 10,000 people at his funeral, and it was said he'd never be forgotten. But how many of you have ever heard of him before today? Thank you. So you can read about Alexander Hamilton in a lot of places, and you can read in fair number of places, most histories of the American Revolution about Horatio Gates. But this will probably be your only opportunity to hear about Marinus Willett, and thank you very much for that. Um, slightly out of turn, we have a citation from Margaret Chin, who's our council um, member from District 1, you know, the first district. And, and Geraldine, would you read that for us? Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm uh, here on behalf of the Colonial Dames uh, to read the citation that Margaret Chin has given to the Lower Manhattan Historical Association. And I'd like to thank the... Uh, and I'd like to thank the Lower Manhattan Historical Association for organizing this event and for participations of the French military and French patriotic groups and for the Lycée Francais participation. And so now I will read the citation. Uh, this is on the 242nd anniversary of the American Revolution, war victories at Saratoga and New Yorktown. She congratulates the LMHA for their work to promote the preservation and education of American history in New York City and beyond. This year, it says, I would like to honor the memories of Horatio Gates, the commander of the American forces at the Battle of Saratoga, Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the United States Treasury, and hero of Yorktown, Lieutenant Colonel Marinus Willett, hero of the American Revolution and New York City politician. I would also like to recognize the French-American alliance that made so many of the victories celebrated today possible. By continuing our transatlantic partnership, it is my hope that we can build on and expand our efforts for peace, prosperity, and freedom for all. Thank you for holding the commemoration to honor the Revolutionary War victories. And by keeping the memory of our history alive, you're ensuring future generations will know the importance of the American Revolution by Margaret Chen, our city council person. Thank you. Okay, next, I'd like to call on uh, Frederick Vigneron, who's a member of the Lower Manhattan, the board of the Lower Manhattan Historical Association. 
And also, I think uh, you have a, you have a rank, do you not, in the French Air Force Citizen Reserve? That is correct. That is correct. Okay, good. You're current, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ambrose. Uh, I'll try to keep this short as possible because there are far more important speakers than me here today. But uh, um, I just wanted to ask a question of why are we here today and how did, how did we get here, uh, especially with all this French participation, which is uh, very impressive and for which we are extremely grateful. A few years back, I came downtown uh, to um, uh, participate or at least observe the um, uh, uh, historical reenactment of the uh, arrival of Lafayette. Uh, to, uh, to the United States. And the uh, Lower Manhattan Historical Association, which had just gotten started, was uh, uh, instrumental in, uh, in welcoming uh, the historical reenactors to Lower Manhattan. So I met the, uh, 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 the leadership of the association, Jim and Ambrose, and they invited me to come to a couple board meetings. And next thing you know, they invited me to join the board, which is probably uh, something they've, they've, they've lived to regret ever since. But maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, during the course of these board meetings, they said, hey, how about getting the French involved in uh, some of these historic events, given the connection of, uh, of France to the American Revolution and to the history of the United States, um, uh, our combined uh, experiences in war and, and peace over the past uh, 200 years or more. And so I said, well, let's see now. I'll, I'll see what I can do. And I started put on my thinking cap. And I said, well, there's so many French organizations in, uh, in New York City. Uh, where do I start? I think I'll start with the A-list. I'll start at the very top. So, so we got the, um, uh, the support of the uh, uh, French consulate. Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. So we got the support of the French Ministry of Defense or uh, Ministry of the Armies. And uh, we got a, a Consul General and, uh, and the uh, head of the military mission to the UN to participate in the Saratoga Yorktown uh, commemoration, which is traditionally held at, uh, at Trinity Church. And uh, finally, uh, 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 during the course of uh, our research on the subject, I was walking around this, uh, this beautiful graveyard, and I found the, the uh, memorial memorial to, uh, to Stephen Rochefontaine. So we started doing some homework on the subject, and uh, I started Googling the, the topic, and I found a beautiful article um, uh, on, uh, on Stephen uh, published in the Journal of the Society of American Military Engineers, known as the Engineer. And inspired by this article, I reached out to the Society of Military <laughs> Engineers, and lo and behold, they are now participating in this wonderful event. Um, Rochefontaine was, of course, um, uh, the first uh, uh, commandant of engineers, or uh, uh, there are so many other French officers. But the point being, it's not just Lafayette and Rochambeau who contributed so much to uh, the success of the uh, American Revolutionary War campaigns, but so many other French officers that also participated, and many of whom came back to the United States after independence and chose to make their lives here. Uh, we will have other speakers who will get into greater detail, but. Um, um, uh, and at, at, on other occasions, I may, go, I may also go into uh, greater detail about the cooperation between the French military and the United States military over the past 200 years, the First World War, the Second World War. We have a veteran of Afghanistan today, uh, Colonel Stanislas de Magnaville, who worked very closely with the uh, uh, US forces and other uh, allied forces in, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, he can, uh, you can approach him. He'd be happy to uh, uh, share his experiences with you, and it's very much of an honor to have so many representatives of the French military here. Uh, of course, the commander of the military mission from the UN, and uh, it's such a thrill to see the saint Syriens uh, here in New York City at uh, St. Paul's Chapel. So I will give myself the hook, ex exit stage left, and whoever's next on the list, go for it, rock and roll. Thank you very much. I think now we have the uh, the individual tributes to our French heroes. Stephen Rochefontaine, we have a presentation. Any? We got it. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eamon, and I thank you for inviting me to this uh, commemoration. Today, I will be talking about one of the lesser known 
contributors to the American war effort in the Revolutionary War, Stephen Rochefontaine, who was born in Aix, France, as Étienne Nicolas Marie Bécher, Sieur de Rochefontaine. He volunteered in Washington's Continental Army after failing to gain a position in the French Royal Corps of Engineers. He became a captain in that corps. Rochefontaine was awarded the rank of major later on in his life for distinguishing service at the Battle of Yorktown, where his engineering skills were indispensable to Washington. In 1783, Rochefontaine returned to France to serve in the military. He became a colonel and, and then returned to the US, where he anglicized his name to Stephen. In 1794, he was appointed a civil engineer by Washington to fortify the New England coast. A year later, President Washington appointed the new Lieutenant Colonel Rochefontaine as the fourth commandment, commandant of the new Corps of Artillerists and Engineers following Major General Louis Le Begue du Portail. In 1795, he became a professor at West Point, as, as was mentioned earlier. He left the Army three years later to live in New York City and died on January 30th, 1814. His tomb is found here in the churchyard of St. Paul's Chapel. And thank you for your kind attention. So, next we get to hear about Pierre L'Enfant, who I guess when he was in New York and had a thriving engineering business was known as Peter. We have next, L'Enfant. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chloe Clerk and I'm honored to be here today commemorating the contributions of Pierre Charles L'Enfant to the United States of America. Pierre Charles L'Enfant was born on August 2, 1754 in Paris, France and died on June 14, 1825 in Prince Georges County. He was a French-American architect, engineer, and urban designer who created the plans for Washington, D.C. Congress recognized his volunteering service and named him Major Engineer in 1783. Later, he designed the Diploma and Medal of the Society of Cincinnati. The Society of the Cincinnati is a hereditary society formed by French and American branches to preserve the honor of the officers that served in the Continental Army and Revolutionary War. L'Enfant returned to New York City in 1784, where he renovated the former City Hall for U.S. Congress as Federal Hall and the Morris House in Philadelphia. When Congress decided to build the Federal cap Capitol, George Washington personally chose L'Enfant to plan it. He brought ideas from the influence of Barret, Baroque and André Le Neutre at Versailles into his plans. In 1787, L'Enfant designed the wood casing for the monuments to General Richard Montgomery in this very chapel. At the time, a reporter wrote the description of the wood casing and pointed out the presence of a rising sun with 13 rays and a bald eagle, possibly referencing to the 13 states and the national animal of the U.S. His service was and still is greatly appreciated. Pierre Charles L'Enfant is surely a symbol of peace and alliance between the United States and France. Thank you all for your time and attention. And I was myself interested to read that both um, Rochefontaine and L'Enfant were professors at West Point. Um, I have a great-grandfather, also named Ambrose, who was the class of 1817 and probably knew them. Um, at the, when West Point started out, it was the, the pretext was we needed engineers in this country, which was true. But West Point, as will probably be explained, was started by Thomas Jefferson, of course, whose contribution to the American Army was to sort of disestablish it and to rely on, on militia. Nonetheless, he was persuaded to start West Point. And as I said, my uh, grandfather was a, was a cadet there. I don't think he was destined, in, destined for military service because out of a class of 19, his rank was 19th. But um, 
you know, he, he was there and he graduated. So next we want to hear from, um, want to hear from Mathilde about uh, Jean-Jacques Caffieri, who did the magnificent sculpture in front of St. Paul's. Mathilde? It's an honor for me to be here today to present uh, a French artist, uh, Jean-Jacques Caffieri. He was a renowned French artist in the 18th century. He was the sculptor du roi, which means uh, the royal sculptor uh, of Louis XV of France. In January 1776, the newly formed United States commissioned the very first sculpture from Mr. Caffieri a monument in homage to General Montgomery. Montgomery was a major general in the Continental Army who led the invasion of Canada against the British. This was one of the Continental Army's first major military actions, though unfortunately during his expedition, Montgomery would lose his life in battle. Benjamin Franklin him himself, who spent, who spent much of his time in France as the US ambassad ambassador, oversaw Caffieri's creation of the sculpture. Fortunately, instead of adorning Phil Philadelphia's Independence Hall as originally foreseen, the monument was delivered to St. Paul's Chapel of New York City. So here in 1788, under the supervision of Pierre Charles L'Enfant, Montgomery was installed. Montgomery's mon monument was installed. The installation of Caffieri's statue represents the strong cultural and political bond that tied the fledgling American democracy and France in 1776, and with sending the test of time, continues to connect us this day, to this day. The statue also began the great binational tradition of France, gifting statues to America, for example, the Statue of Liberty. Thank you. That's marvelous, and I can't help but think that the placing of the statue in front of St. Paul's Church was um, done as sort of a deliberate affront to the, uh, to I guess the old rector of Trinity Church, uh, Charles Inglis, who was a staunch Tory and actually um, wrote a rebuttal of Thomas Paine's common sense about why people should be obeying their ordained ruler, George III. Um, unfortunately for him, the Sons of Liberty burned most of the copies of that, so very few people actually got to read it. And Inglis, after the war, was asked if he could reconcile with the uh, former rebels, and he said probably not, and he moved, moved to Canada. However, that's a whole other story about how the uh, Trinity evolved with the times and became the center of the American Episcopalian movement and whatnot. Um, as they said, Washington has a pew at St. Paul's, but he had to win a war to get it. Um, but uh, it's, it's been amazing how the um, various parties have been able to evolve and reconcile over the years. Uh, next, I want to call upon uh, General Roland Marguerite, who is the French advisor to uh, the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. As the head of the French Republic's military mission to the UN, representing the French Ministry of Defense, as well as the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it is with a great gratitude that we accept the invitation of the Lower Manhattan Historical Association to join its constituent and allied organizations, as well as a distinguished representative of both American and French organizations present here at St. Paul's Chapel of Trinity Church, Wall Street Parish, in commemorating the American revolutionary victories of Saratoga and Yorktown. As the most senior French military officer now working and living here in New York City, my adopted new home for the tenure of my mission, it is also an exceptional honor and pleasure to be here with you my fellow New Yorkers gathered here to in paying tribute to the American patriots as well as their French allied soldiers and friends 
who fought for the independence of these great nations, the United States, in its noble quest for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. France was the first and the most important allied of the newly self-declared independent United States of America. The Treaty of Alliance signed in 1778 formalizing our military and diplomatic relationship. The Alliance as well stood the test of time over the past 241 years. 238 years ago, in 1791, the winds of freedom brought the regimental battle standards of our two peoples as we surrounded and defeated the British forces of General Cornwallis at Yorktown. This decisive victory was made possible by the courageous and valiant determination of the Continental Army, led by General George Washington, notable French volunteers, such as the Marquis de Lafayette, and the regimentals of the Earl of Rochambeau, as well as the ships and sailors of Admiral de Grasse. Just under two years later, on September 3, 1783, representatives of British Crown signed the Treaty of Paris. Through this document, we relinquished all claims to its former American colonies, recognized the sovereignty of the United, State, United States and agreed to exchange ambassador with the time. Nearly 11,000 French men crossed the Atlantic Ocean to support, in a common ideal, the aspiration of an entire people to achieve independence and build a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition of all men and created equal. Sealing the historical ties between our two nations, these men whose memory we honor today embody a unique brotherhood defined by the blood they shed together on the battlefield in the common cause of freedom. Indeed, the spirit and the reality of freedom for which these men fought in 1791 flourish in the newly in this newly independent United States of America. And it was the descendants of Yorktown, as well as the children of so many immigrants flocking to this great nation, also in search of liberty, who twice in the 20th century crossed the Atlantic Ocean to fight alongside its French and European allies in confronting tyranny. General John Pershing First World War American Expeditionary Force and the GI's Army Aviators and Sailors, who as part of the Allied Expeditionary Force, braved the murderous beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944, are eternal symbols of the unfailing bonds between our two nations. The campaigns in Korea in the early 1950s, under the same blue beret, and then in Afghanistan, as part of the International Security Assistance Force, again saw our soldiers fighting side by side against tyranny. Today, as we fought together in the Second World War in defeating Nazism, French armed forces continue to fight alongside our American allies, especially in the Levant and in the Sahel regions in confronting the cruelest form of extremism, ter terrorist tyranny. Our naval forces conduct parallel missions and train jointly on the ocean around the world. Our operational compab compatibility is excellent, continually enhanced by our regular participation in major joint exercises. The same is true for our aviators who have developed an excellent working relationship and friendship thanks to their participation in so many operational joint mission and joint training programs. The collaboration of our special forces as well as our intelligence and cyber cooperation is remarkable. Our common network of liaison and exchange officers is characterized by both depth and breadth 
extending to the level of general officers. It was in Yorktown that his brotherhood of arm united the destiny of our people forever. From then on, the unconditional engagement of our soldiers fighting side by side changed the course of history forever. Long live the United States of America. Long live France and long live our everlasting friendship. Next, we're going to hear from uh, the United States Military Academy. Leslie, get your name right. Ledley Klosky, right? That's, that's that was good. Well pretty pretty good? Well okay, done. good. Yeah. Thank you. Right dead on. Okay, not, good. Thanks very much. Thanks. thanks very much. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to begin by apologizing for any French, any French that I use or attempt to use during my remarks here. Um, I figure my skills are somewhere between uh, un petit bébé and maybe Peter Sellers. So I, I apologize in advance. You know. OK, so I wanted to say, I better get the cheaters out here. I wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this recognition of the victories of Saratoga and Yorktown. These victories were made possible not only through those things which we are most familiar with in the military spirit, and that's uh, courage, tenacity. These are the stock and trade of the military. But this was also made possible through the meticulous preparation of military engineers. Fighting is a technical business, and America, frankly, did not have the tools, the technical tools, to carry out warfare against a significant uh, foe like the British in those early days. And so we relied instead uh, on engineers who came directly to the aid of the Continental Army from Europe. They came from Germany, they came from Poland, but, but especially, and in the largest numbers, they came from France. As you know or have heard, um, I'm, a, I'm an engineering professor, not a, not a historian, so I'll qualify my remarks in that way. But I can say with certainty that our academy and our nation owe a significant debt of gratitude to our earliest international partners, our earliest international par partners, people like Stephen Roche Fontaine, who we heard about already, for supporting our nascent republic at considerable personal and financial risk. But the story of Stephen Roche Fontaine is not the story of a lone individual. Quite the contrary, he was one of many early French-American engineers. That's the legacy of French engineering in America that I'd like to talk about. One early but very important French engineer is often forgotten, at least by the general public, and this is Louis de Portal. At 30, 34 years old, he was young, like so many of Washington's officers, he arrived in America to join Washington and the Continental Army during a very tough period for that army. He was a graduate of the Royal Engineering School at Mezier and was promoted to colonel almost immediately upon arrival. So 34 years old, new to America, colonel. And then almost immediately put in charge of the Corps of Engineers, which was a nascent organization in those days, um, over uh, American officers who were glad to step aside to make room for this technician. Um, Duportel was critical to the Army's success and was responsible for far too many things to list here. Let's say that the location of the fortifications at West Point, he was instrumental in that decision, all the way until the direction of the siege at Yorktown. The siege at Yorktown was quite a sophisticated operation, multi-step, lots of people and, uh, and equipment and material involved, and he directed most of that. Um, he remained with Washington for six years, six years without pay or expenses departing for France only after the war was completed. Men like Duportel were so important because both military engineering and great and general engineering skills were almost completely lacking in the colonies in those early days. And the success of both the Revolution and the Young Republic hinged on the special skills and knowledge brought to our shores by French military engineers from the great engineering schools of France, well established at that time, Ponce Chassé, Saint-Cyr, Mezier, and Metz. I work in a building that's named for a gentleman named uh, Dennis Hart Mahan, quite a famous early American engineer. But you might ask yourself, well, how did an, Amer an early American engineer come to be an engineer at all? Well, the answer is that he first studied at West Point under a fellow by the name of Claudius Crozet, one of the earliest uh, real math professors in the United States, who translated a lot of his French knowledge into American textbooks. Also, um, Dennis Hart Mahan would have spent his entire first year as a plebe studying French. 
And the reason was so that he could use the French textbooks, which formed the, uh, the West Point Library in 1820, around that time, that had all been brought back by Sylvanus Thayer. Um, let's see. So at, and after graduating West Point, it's worth pointing out, where did Mahan go to finish his education, basically do his master's degree? He went to the Ecole d'Artilleurs et Ingenieurs in Metz. I'm sure I slaughtered that, but that's where he went. That's the legacy of French engineering that I'm talking about. And Claudius Trozet himself, who had come here from France, a French-trained engineer and mathematician, he then went on to take on the role of the head of transportation for the state of Virginia and then Louisiana. He also built the longest hard rock tunnel, right, this is pre-dynamite days. So imagine digging a railroad tunnel 4,200 feet long, digging it from both ends in hard rock, in hard rock in about three years. And when they hold through, meaning when the two, when the two ends met, they met to within six inches from the two ends. And that tunnel is still there. Its elliptical shape was spe specially calculated to resist the stresses of that area, and it drains itself. Not one pump or mechanical thing is anywhere in that tunnel. So it's like a big horseshoe in there that drains itself. And it was in service for almost 100 years, and now is in consideration for use as a bicycle greenway through that same area. And there's a town, there's a town there named Crozet, Virginia, where he settled after, after he dug that rockfish gap tunnel. So anyway, I, I hope my, my, uh, my remarks have helped to set Stephen Rochefontaine, who's here, in context. He's woven into a complex tapestry of a, a combination of French know-how and early American can-do spirit that built much of what you see, including, uh, including much of the early curriculum at West Point, where I work today. So thanks very much. Next, we have a presentation from the American Society of Military Engineers, Society of American Military Engineers. Uh, Suzanne Liu. Suzanne, OK, here we go. OK, good, good. Uh, French engineers in uh, the American Revolution, the uh, colonials, uh, wouldn't have uh, been able to win the war if it weren't for our French engineering um, co-patriots. Um, the American colonials were just uh, merchants and farmers with guns. Uh, they had no idea what to do, how to ford a stream, uh, how to uh, create uh, fresh water for themselves at camp, or how to build the trains. Uh, so the French engineers brought all of these wonderful uh, concepts uh, to um, uh, the war effort, because uh, wars can't be won without engineers. Um, so they were responsible for the, our coastal fortifications. And um, at the end of the war, Congress decided to disband the army. Uh, however, very soon there was another threat that came by, and very soon there was another war. And so the Corps of Engineers was born because of that. Um, there was more formality now, and the Corps of Engineers was formed, um, and uh, Congress also authorized a, an engineering school to be uh, part of this uh, ongoing military operation, if you will, and so that was West Point. Uh, was formed because of that. And so here today at St. Paul's Chapel, we honor our French engineer patriot, Stephen Rochefontaine, which is buried here in St. Uh, Paul's. Thank you. I would like to add to uh, uh, what Suzanne said. Uh, we are, Suzanne and I are both architects. <clears throat> and although we've been talking about uh, the contribution to engineering, uh, that has been, that has been uh, the contribution from France to the United States, we cannot forget the contribution to architecture that comes from France. Uh, we as architects, in, in, uh, in, in our traditional way, have, have, have uh, 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 established and, and the basis of our learning has come from the French Institute. The, the, uh, all of our studies come from the Beaux-Arts uh, 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 and it has developed the, uh, the, the, the foundation for many of the buildings that we see, see here, the presentations, the art, and, and the understanding and, and appreciation of the aesthetic of, of what we n know now as New York architecture come from the base of, of, of our, of our, of our, of our uh, friends and colleagues in France. Thank you.
mentioned in our talk about L'Enfant that uh, he was also an architect who did the, um, the renovations of City Hall. Um, and during the, when the renovations were done, Congress was meeting in Francis Tavern at that, at that time. So the Ninth Continental Congress actually met in, in Francis Tavern while they were redoing it to make space for um, the two houses of, uh, of, of Congress that, that met there. And, and of course, you see the pictures of the way it used to be. And I think one of the great regrets that we have about Federal Hall with the statue of George Washington in front of him and is it's not the same Federal Hall. You know, this is something that came, you know, uh, after the original building was, was torn down, maybe it outgrew its foundations, but it was a marvelous structure as, as prepared and conceived by Lafon. You see pictures of it, it's not there, so you can only imagine it and see the models. I think at this point we're going to proceed to, uh, led by the the uh, Veteran Corps of Artillery to the statue of Rochefontaine. I think everybody who's participated is here. Thanks again, once again, to everybody who participated. I thought we had some marvelous presentations. As usual, I learned something. Um, and um, thanks especially to the Lower Manhattan Historical Association that organizes this and all of the other groups. Uh, thank you for coming and being a part of this, uh, this very special event.